power. Realize your power. Fighting out myself. Fighting out myself. Power. Realize your power. Fighting out myself. Fighting out myself. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another Saturday edition of A Quiet Time. Today, we're going to focus on a title called Time to Wrestle. Many of us, if not all of us, have heard the proverb that talks about the time to do this, a time to do that, right? A time to do things and a time to refrain from doing things. Well, in this life, there's also a time to wrestle and as you see here on the photo you might be wrestling against forces that are much bigger than you and if they are spiritual forces and their forces on the other side then you're going to have to wrestle with somebody bigger than you in other words that someone bigger than you being christ is going to have to wrestle on your behalf and you're going to have to get out the way but oftentimes just wrestling period means wrestling even against ourselves. And to be honest with you, that's one of the hardest wrestling matches that there are. So today we're gonna focus in on some scriptures that'll help us, one, know what the wrestling match is all about, two, know how to wrestle, and three, some of the nuances about wrestling that we might not known about and of course, we're talking about all of this on a spiritual playing field. So let us get going with the study, Time to Wrestle. Amen. Hallelujah. Each week we start out with our mission statement, which is, we are a group of people designed to draw closer to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, through Christ Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit. As we see here, we see a man who doesn't look like he's nowhere in the ballpark being able to wrestle against that entity that you see on the other side who's so big we can't even see the entity's face. But hey, David defeated Goliath, right? And he defeated him by faith and he defeated him by experience in the faith. So you can overcome major obstacles, but you do have to wrestle. So in order for us to draw closer to the Father where he's going to show us all the tactics and the information needed to be successful in that wrestling match, we know we can only get there by Jesus who had to wrestle with all mankind, wrestled to the point of going on the cross prior to that, was wrestling within himself, start dropping blood from his head and things like that and you know inquiring or whether or not the disciples can even stay awake with him we talked about that just a couple of weeks ago so all of that was a wrestling match in fact when he was out there for 40 days and 40 nights with no food or drink and the devil came to tempt him that was a wrestling match he had to wrestle within himself and he had to wrestle with satan himself and satan of course left him looking for a more opportune time to come back and of course that time came back as he was about to go on the cross and we know it's a fact when he was on the cross so we can only get there through jesus christ to get closer to the father that we can get that power that we need that is by the holy spirit we have to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And we're not going to be winning any kind of real wrestling match. And we definitely are not going to be able to beat that wrestling match against ourselves. So therein lies our mission statement. Amen. Hallelujah. Each week in Drawing Closer, we focus on a passage of scripture. Today, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 32 verses 22 through 28, where Jacob wrestles with God. And it says, that night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone 
and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go until you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Okay, there's a boat load here. We are not going to unload the boat load. We will be going back to this passage of scripture again, how we do it, where we work out from different muscle angles as it relates to a particular passage of scripture. We're gonna do that here, but we will unload some of the treasure. So first off, verse 22, that night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants and his 11 sons across the fourth of the job. So he did this at night. So what it looks like to me is he did this at night for a reason because, you know, there's people out there that would love to see you moving about doing what you do and seeing if they can see all your stuff when you doing it. And there are people that like to make their moves and all, and they want everybody to see what they got when they're making their moves, sort of like Mansa Musa did when he came across Europe to go over to Arabia and he brought all this gold and men's servants and women's servants, et cetera. And it wasn't long thereafter that Africa was invaded. So you can't be just doing all your moves all in the broad daylight where everybody can see it because there's going to be some jealous folks and people trying to survive as best they can, however they can, by hook or by crook. And you're going to be an unnecessary target. Verse 23 says, after he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So wait a minute. So Jacob valued in this order. Let me make sure my wives and female servants and sons, so women and children first, before I even send my possessions over there. Now, part of that could be that um, the possessions I'm gonna send, I need somebody over there to make sure to keep an eye on them. So this is why I gotta send them over there first before my possessions. So Jacob was left alone. Now, not until he was left alone did this go down. He was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. So notice that the scriptures say a man. Now we know it's just not a regular man, but if it says a man, then someone came in the form of a man. So now hold on now. The title of this says Jacob wrestles with God. But people say that Jesus Christ only came to the earth one time when he was a baby and he had never come as a man before. Well, okay. And then other people say, well, this was an angel. Okay, but he wrestled with God. So even if it was an angel, it's giving us insight into that these entities that act on behalf of the Lord, it's still dealing with the Lord. It's still dealing with the Father. And what are we looking for? We got a mission to draw closer to the Father through Jesus Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So even going through whatever this was, was it an angel, as some say, some passages talk about that. If it, if it was, we know it wasn't God himself. It was Jesus Christ. Then God himself is the one that's making the order. Regardless, this is important to know. And you would think that when Jesus did come to the earth in the form of a baby, as we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that the people back then would have been able to understand this passage of scripture because this is Old Testament. This is so Old Testament, it's Genesis. 
And so they should have been able to understand that when Jesus says the father is in me and I am in the father, that they would say, well, duh, that's a no brainer, right? Especially since Nicodemus came at night and said nobody could be doing this stuff unless they were sent from God. And Jesus says, well, you can't even see me, right? And so obviously it's showing that they really couldn't see him because some of these obvious answers that Jesus gave them, which would be the only answers that a person could give them if they were acting on behalf of the Father, then this is the only way that Jesus could say what he said, right? So it just came down to, well, whether he's acting from the Father or whether he's acting on his own. And they had that question and that debate happened. And he says, I'm not here on my own accord. So he's talking really common sense to them as it relates to these scriptures that anybody who would have understood the scriptures who was supposed to be Israel's leaders or teachers like Jesus said to Nicodemus and you're Israel's teacher that somehow they weren't really digging in to the word and so you got a lot of people today say well I don't go into the Old Testament very much because it's Old Testament and it's past and have the veil over their eyes to this day not being able to see that the revelation of Jesus Christ has to do with revealing the Old Testament in relation to Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing right now. So when he was alone, a man wrestled with him till daybreak. So they wrestled from the night to the day. Hey, what's the name of this title? A Time to Wrestle. Sometime you gotta wrestle with some stuff. And sometimes you gotta wrestle with some stuff all night. And sometimes night can be a season, not just in this 24 hour period where there's darkness and light and there in light the first day. Sometimes darkness can last a period of years and be a season. And you're gonna have to wrestle through that entire season. Verse 25 says, when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. So wait a minute now. So the man couldn't overpower him in a wrestling match, but he can just simply touch his hip and basically make him kind of crippled to a certain extent for the rest of his life by a single touch. But in wrestling him, he couldn't overpower him. So, you know, there's some deep insight into that. Whereas there's this, this word that comes from on high, it's sort, of, sort of like Job, right? Where Satan was asked by God, have you considered my servant Job? There's nobody like him. And then Satan's like, well, you got a protection around him and that's why. And God's like, okay, you can do this to him. You can do this to his family, but you can't kill the man. So that, you know, same scriptures where God talks about how the waters are told to stop and they can't go but so far. So in other words, if God puts out a word about you, then nobody can overrule that word, not even say, nobody can overrule that word. So as it related to this wrestling, he could not overpower him because like this picture here, he would have just thrown him. And if he would have thrown him, then what God wanted to come out of the situation wouldn't come out of the situation. So God is going to put on you, as he says in the scriptures, no more than you can bear because there's something that he needs to come out of the situation. If he wanted to crush us, and there's other scriptures that says he does not crush us, he does not treat us as our sins deserve, then he's going to do just the amount that's needed to get you to do what you're supposed to do so that he doesn't just destroy our confidence, etc. So when he touched the socket of his hip, he let Jacob know, if I wanted to, I could have even just killed you right on the spot. So don't get it twisted. Verse 26. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. So now he's breathing confidence into him. 
Jacob's all confident, right? Because even when he touched his socket and all, Jacob still didn't let him go. So it shows the character of Jacob in the layman term, you know, in the hip term, uh, Jacob was no punk. So even though he had a little injury, he was still rocking and rolling. Sometimes we take a hit in life. Sometimes we take a few hits in life. Sometimes we not on our A game, but we still have to wrestle, right? This is a great message for me personally, I know. So if it's not working for somebody else, you know, hey, Lord be with you, but it's definitely working for me. No matter what's going on, right? Because right now my ankle isn't feeling too well, but hey, I gotta still wrestle the stuff before me I still gotta do. And there's wrestling matches that are still in my mix, right? But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And that's a heavy weight. So Jacob knows what he's dealing with. So Jacob didn't say, okay, well, this man of God is a man of God and I don't wrestle with him because he's a man of God. So one, he's not showing fear. As we said, he, he's no punk. Two, he's like, I'm not letting you go. Now, I know you can do whatever you can do, but you're going to have to just take me out. Even though he just sent over his wives, his children on the other side, he just sent over all his possessions, but he's like, what's going on right now, right? You go, wait a minute now, he got wives and servants and 11 kids, so he's gotta have something going on if he's able to feed and take care of all these folks and he's got a bunch of possessions. What does he mean, bless me? He's like, I, I, I need something else. I need something else than the material blessings. I need something else more than the physical blessings. I need another level of blessings. And so if another level has come my way and allowed me to wrestle with this other level, then I'm going to say no other level. You got to bless me at another level. So are we wrestling with the opportunity to gain at another level? Because to get to a higher level, it is going to take a serious wrestling match. And if you are a child of God, it's going to take a serious spiritual wrestling match. Now you can come up in the negativity. You can come up doing some crazy stuff, right? You might not necessarily get the same wrestling match if you're willing to surrender and just go all out there crazy and however you need to get it is how you get it. But if you're trying to keep your stuff intact with the Lord, the other side is going to put you through a wrestling match. And in this situation, it's God himself. So even God is going, hey man, you got to put out some effort. You got to show me you got some heart. You, God does not want people who don't have no heart coming into his program. So now if this is how Jacob's got to wrestle and he's Israel and Jesus is God in the flesh, then why is it that people are presenting Jesus like we said last week and the week before as some weakling? Here we seeing how strong Jacob is and he's the one being named Israel. Jesus is the king of Israel. Jesus is the one who's the voice of God that's speaking these words, even if an angel is saying that it had to come through Jesus. So here it is that Jesus cannot be no lightweight. He cannot be based on this image that's presented to us all the time. And that man said, right? Then the man said, what is your name? The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Wait a minute. Didn't we just say last week and the week before that we're going to continue to talk about why the name Israel means what it means and that it means something specific and it's just not a name and that you had to be a people saved by the Lord to be construed to that name 
And here it says, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel because for this reason, his name was changed to Israel for this reason, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. So no, you can't be construed as Israel if you're not wrestling and overcoming in the world with mankind and wrestling with the Lord. So you got to get over here and you got to talk to the Lord about your issues. You got to be real with the Lord. You got to wrestle with the Lord and say, uh-uh, Lord. Like the man who said, I do believe. Help me overcome my disbelief. That's wrestling with the Lord. Hey, I got some issues, Lord. You bless me. You help me overcome this. Now, when he told Paul, okay, my grace is sufficient for thee. But Paul was like, hey, Lord, you got to take this from me. And Jesus was like, okay, my grace is sufficient for thee. When Jesus talked to the Father, he says, not as I will, but as you will. So why are people running around if you have to wrestle with the reality of where you're at? Then why is it that people can tell you in a religious setting that you can't even wrestle with leadership? Really? Somebody is crazy enough to tell you that? That you just got to jump in line and get in line? Really? Come on, man. That ain't even close to reality. I'm not saying you got to go out there and be some rebel, some knucklehead. You got to respect those that the Lord has raised up. But respecting the Lord is what is being described by the Lord. So you don't see God saying, what you doing wrestling with me? You disrespectful. You should let me just wrestle you down and pin you. One, two, three, and tap out. Why didn't he say that? Why didn't he say, Jacob, you wrestling me, you better stop. You better tap out. So he's saying, wrestle with me, but wrestle with me with respect. He said, I ain't gonna let you go till you bless me. He didn't say, I ain't letting you go because I'm rebellious. But you got to wrestle with him to understand that you got to overcome this old character. And therein lies our drawing closer portion of today's study. Amen. Hallelujah. Each week we focus on our opening prayer. We again go to a passage of scripture. Today we're going to look at Psalm chapter 13 and verse 2 in the NIV. And as the picture shows, we're going to continue with this wrestling theme because it's a time to wrestle. But in verse two, he says, how long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? This is a lot. It's a little, but it's a lot. First off, we talked about how that wrestling match with yourself. We talked about the last few weeks, how it's not about our mindset. It's about God's mindset. It's about having the same mindset of Jesus Christ, thinking the way he thinks, reacting the way he reacts. Our emotions being what his emotions are. And so when it's opposite that, then we're gonna have to wrestle. And so it's plain here. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? That's what we said in the last scripture, how it cannot just only be a day. We hope it's just that night and the next day is all good. But what did I say? Sometimes it's a season and the nighttime is a season. And so here we see that this is being described by David, that he was going through a season. How long? must I wrestle with my thoughts? How long must I go through this season? How long must I continue to seek the positive words that God provides the truth against this deception, against these emotions? He spells it out specifically. And day after day have sorrow in my heart. 
He's going, the sorrow in my heart are based on the thoughts that are in my head, based on the activities that are in my life. So I got to wrestle against that. I can't just succumb to what I think. And people go, man, that's got to be extremely difficult, Rodney. It is when you don't understand the word of God. You need the word of God. You got to see what he's saying about a specific thing. If you're wrestling with some thoughts and you don't know that David wrestled with thoughts, Jesus wrestled with thoughts, and then they actually prescribe the way to deal with it. And the way to deal with it is to wrestle. But if you don't have a word that you can hold on to, you don't have any ammunition to use in the wrestling match. Because we saw last week and the week before what it said, the Lord is my strength. And we know the Lord is the word of God, God in the flesh. So Jesus Christ, I got to have him in me. I got to have the word in me. I got to have the Holy Spirit in me just to deal against me, just to deal with me. I'm a handful all to myself, right? You, We're all handfuls all to ourselves. You don't even need another human being to be nowhere around you. You can just be you. You ever see that movie where my man was on the island, he was just by himself, and then he took the volleyball and cast away, and he was going crazy by himself. So your mind can play tricks on you all by yourself when you start believing that you thought it and it's real. So you're going to have to have some strength against the way you think, because guess what? We're part of fallen man. And so the mindset of fallen man that came from the enemy entered into us. Like the scriptures talk about Judas and it says, Satan entered into him. That's why we saw the scriptures where it says you swept clean and then they go looking for seven more demons more powerful than the one that left to try to come back and have Tennessee in your mind. So you gotta be up on the word at all times and be able to dig up into it and say, all right, I need some game here because right now I'm tripping because I'm not fired up. And when you're not fired up, something's going on. If you stay in that status long enough, man, you can lose yourself. So day after day, he was in this particular position in this particular season. And he asked how long Will my enemy triumph over me? Well, David had something going on that a lot of people don't, which is one, knowing that it wasn't him. Even though he said my thoughts, but somebody's feeding those thoughts. It's the enemy. It's the enemy that's got him in the place that he's at mentally, and he knows it. And he's asking the Lord how long before he gets a reprieve so that's no different than Jacob doing the wrestling where he's going, hey, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. David is going, hey, man, I'm wrestling, but I need a reprieve. Jacob needed a reprieve and David needed a reprieve. And so when Jacob got a reprieve, he was given a new name, the name of Israel. So you might need a reprieve but you stay wrestling until you get that reprieve. That's how you walk around with that name. So when he says salvation, he has become my salvation. What did we talk about? Being saved from what? We said that last week, right? Being saved from what? From a fallen mindset. And this is further proof that we were on point understanding the mindset. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this opening prayer right now. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you again for your word. Thank you so much for the confidence that you give us when we focus in on your word, that you explain to us the truths about life, just not just breathing, but even just our thinking, how our everyday regular thoughts are not regular and how we got to gauge how we think. And we got to protect that from our hearts and how our hearts can really move even negatively based on negative thinking. And I'm not talking about motivational speaking, Lord. I'm talking about the truth 
as it relates to the truth will set you free. And so the deception of the situation where we can't defeat what we're in, we can't overcome the scenario that's about us, that season that we're in, we're never going to make it out. No, we got to be able to say, I am going to make it out, Father. Help us to say, we are going to make it out, but help us to be real and say, God, I need your help. I, I'm, I'm on fumes right now. Elijah said, Lord, I'm on fumes. You sent him a raven, right? David is going, Lord, I'm on fumes. Jacob wrestled till daybreak. Okay, bless me. I'm on fumes. We got to be able to say, I'm on fumes and not act like we, you know, pretending we got it going on, man, I'm on fumes and the Lord will come and get us. So thank you so much, Father, for allowing Jesus Christ to show us in advance by going to the cross that he's already come to get us. He sent us the Holy Spirit to empower us, to give us the strength to go to the word because we don't feel like it at all times. And that's when we go, okay, Lord, I don't feel like going to this word. Give me the strength. Help the Holy Spirit to help me to open up this word, dig in, focus in, and listen to a quiet time, something, so I can get what I need to get, so I can get strengthened again, so that I'm able to continue to wrestle to the point where God will remove that particular obstacle and give you a reprieve. Another obstacle could come later, but you're like, all right, I, I need some rest. I can get a reprieve. You know, Elijah had to deal with some more stuff later on, but he got a reprieve. So thank you so much, Father God, for your truth in the word, helping us to navigate through this life. And it's in your precious son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All righty. The game of all games is underway. Ready. It is now time to play the recap game. Hope you guys are fired, excited, ready to go. You've studied this. You was with us last week, you paid attention, or you studied this on your own. Let us get going with... Let's go, team! Let's go! Question number one. Ready. Who is your salvation? Is it A, church, B, baptism, C, the Lord, or D, tithing? Who is your salvation? Who says A, church? All right. How about B, baptism? Okay. Who says C, the Lord? C. C. All right. What about D, tithing? Okay. The correct answer is C, the Lord. The Lord is our salvation. The scriptures showed us God is our salvation and the Lord is our salvation. Since God and the Son are one in the same spirit, then there it is. And you have that spirit, right? So, hey, see, the Lord is your salvation. All righty. Question number two. Where do we draw eternal water from? Is it A, Jordan River, B, Wells of Salvation, C, the River Nile, or D, the English Channel? Where do we draw eternal water from? Who says A, Jordan River? All right, what about B, Wells of Salvation? B. 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 Okay, how about C, the River Nile? Okay, who says D, the English Channel? All right, the correct answer is B, Wells of Salvation. I know we sing that song, Jordan River, I'm about to cross, right? But it's Wells of Salvation. So yeah, it's not the Jordan River that you're drawing eternal water from. It's not the River Nile or the English Channel. It's the Wells of Salvation. And that's coming from the heavenly realms, from Christ Jesus and the Father himself. All righty. Question number three. Who is great among you? Is it A, the richest man in the world, B, the Holy One of Israel, C, my idol, or D, the strongest man in the world? Who is great among you? Who says A, 
the richest man in the world. All right. But how about B, the Holy One of Israel? B. B. Okay, who says C? My idol. All right. And how about D, the strongest man in the world? All right. The correct answer is B, the Holy One of Israel. And hopefully, based on the scriptures that we've shown today, so, okay, he wrestled with God and mankind. And as a result of that, that's why he was named that name. But this says the Holy One of Israel. That means the one who named him. So who's more important? The one who named him or the one that was named? So let's not get it twisted. It's the Holy One of Israel. It's the one who was holy that he asked to bless him. And that's Jesus Christ. So the Holy One of Israel is over Israel, above Israel, Lord of Israel. So anything that was given to Israel, whether it be commandments, truth, revelations, prophets, apostles, you name it, whatever it is, he's above all of it. So you can't use anything that you received and then say, I'm going to use what I received from the one that gave it to me and hold him in check with that. Jacob shows you that. He shows you that, well, I can hold him and say, bless me, but I know the fact is he could have just flipped me and flipped me to the other side of the universe if he wanted to, and he didn't. So when I did it, I did it with humility. So when I come to Christ, I got to be coming at him with humility. So you can't be going over saying Israel, 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 and it's not being referred to the one that's the holy one. He's above all that. So focus on him and that'll help you out a great deal. All right. Bonus question number four. When were you included in Christ? Was it A, when you heard and believed in the message of truth, B, when you became financially independent, C, the day you got water baptized, or D, the day you started going to church. When were you included in Christ? Who says A, when you heard and believed in the message of truth? A. 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 All right, how about B, when you became financially independent. Okay, who says C, the day you got water baptized. All right, and what about D, the day you started going to church. All right, the correct answer is A, when you heard and believed in the message of truth. So a lot of people think it's one of them other B, C, and Ds, but it's really not. You better go back and listen to the study is when you heard and believed in the message of truth and to go a step further, you prove that belief by putting that faith into action based on what you claim to believe in. So if you believe he's the ruler of all things, which is the only way you could be baptized into Christ is to believe he's above all things. Then you start living your life based on that action and you ain't bowing down to other stuff. All righty. So, hey, you know what I say. Your willingness to play this game and your heart to play this game tells me that y'all got Thank you game. Much. Thank you so much for playing the game. Really appreciate it. Fun, exciting, but serious business at the same time. You know what I say. Your willingness to play the game because not everybody is willing that we will get the right answers. If we get the wrong answers, it will help us build our convictions. And the objective is week over week to grow in our knowledge, grow in our understanding, accomplish the wisdom that God has purposed for us, and to get all of that into our hearts, our spirit, our soul, where we build conviction. Amen. Amen. So thank y'all for playing the game. It is now time to dig in. Today, we're going to go back and dig into Galatians chapter 2. 
We're going to start it out in verses 1 through 12 in the NIV. Again, the study title today is Time to Wrestle. And this heading is Paul accepted by the apostles, starting in verse 1. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. So off the top here, we talked about this before. It was 14 years that Paul was rolling and he was not rolling with somebody over him other than Jesus Christ. But now based on what you have seen in the passages prior we know that one, the Lord is our salvation. And two, is when you heard the message of truth that you were saved. And he heard that message of truth directly from Jesus himself. That's when he got blinded. So then now he's rolling around with the Holy Spirit. So he knows how to keep in step with the Holy Spirit. So it would be important to focus in on somebody like this and look for the ways he was operating that would help us know how to keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Because the scriptures told us to test all spirits. That means anybody and everybody who says, thus saith the Lord included. So wouldn't it be more important to know how to keep in step with the spirit and to see how Paul was doing what he was doing directly rolling with the spirit and Jesus Christ. I'm not saying about the fellowship, don't get with the fellowship or what have you. I'm saying you can't rely on that. You got to rely on God himself, the son and the Holy Spirit. And the son is also the word. And then you fellowship with one another so that iron sharpens iron by the word. And the scripture talks about how disagreements may happen to see who has the Lord's approval, which means there's two people who think, two or more, who think that the word is saying something different and they got contrasting views on what the word is saying. And then the Lord will then make it clear by showing forth where the truth is. As long as you're not doing it from a prideful standpoint, an arrogant standpoint, as long as there's two people with a genuine heart that really see it differently and they can't just get it the other way. And it's like, I, I just can't see it that way. And then they go to the Lord and say, Lord, I think I'm right, not for right sake, but I want to do the right thing or walk the right way. So help me to see it correctly. And the other person does the same thing where two or three are gathered in my name. There I am in the midst of them. And then Jesus Christ will make it evident. But if you go in this, I know what I'm talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. And now you're convinced that what you're saying is real and you're not leaving room to be checked. Then that's a problem. So 14 years he was rolling this way. Then in verse two, it says, I went in response to a revelation. And you hear that? I went in response to a revelation. Not I went in response to somebody telling me. And meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders. So it was the revelation that led him there that led him to go meet privately with those esteemed as leaders. So is it the leaders or is it the revelation? You want the revelation more than you want the leader. You want the revelation, even if the leader gave it to you, it will still be the revelation above the leader. So it's the Holy one of Israel above Israel. It's the revelation above the leader. I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. So this is what he was already doing. So he's going, all right, let me go present to them how I roll. So this is how he's already rolling, right? I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Now, isn't that what we just said? If you do it from a noble heart, from a humble disposition to say, okay, I think the way I'm saying it is the correct way. But I want to check it out because there's, I might not be on point. Even if I got nine points out of 10, I might have one point off. So let me check it out with some folks that are esteemed as leaders and see where they're coming from. Because I don't want to be out here running my race in vain. After 14 years, how many people have you talked to 
in 14 years. So he would have had to go back and make them corrections. Verse three says, yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. So that was part of the discussion, the law, right? And he's going, wait a minute now, Titus knew better than that. So Titus was rolling with Paul. And Titus had such a conviction. He's like, I'm not, I, I can't, I just can't see it that way, right? This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. So they came in, it says, to spy on the freedom that they had. So wait a minute now. You got some false believers. They weren't even real. They came in chest to throw a monkey wrench in the game. That's the purpose of them showing up. So there's people who do that. There's people who are not really believers, not really on point, not trying to be on point, that just come up with contrasting arguments for argument's sake. And oftentimes we waste our time actually arguing with these folks, right? So he says, we did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So you got to stand on what's true and you got to preserve that truth for others. That is why I record these things because hopefully I'm speaking truth. Hopefully if something I'm saying you don't agree with, you getting with me and saying, hey man, I don't see it that way. Let's have a discussion. And then the Lord will make it plain and I can go back and correct it for folks if I'm wrong. But two, if it's truth, what I'm saying, which I believe it is, then it's preserved on tape. Same concept, right? So verse six says, as for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. So he goes, I'm not tripping off the fact that they're leaders, right? It's, it's do they know what they're talking about? So he's telling us right off the top. I did say that they were leaders because I'm, I'm basically taking the benefit of the doubt because they're leaders. These are the guys that know what they're talking about. But don't get it twisted. Just because they're leaders, I'm not going to roll with what they're saying just because they're leaders. Even though they're leaders, they got to be saying what's on point. So didn't we say the revelation is more valuable than the leadership, right? So whatever they were made no difference to him. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. So you got to have a message. And what's being said has to add to your message, right? It's like, you know, I used to sell for, for solar. You know, I still do solar, but working with these solar companies. And they would say, hey, we got this right up with this thing over here. Anybody can use this information. And I'd look at it and go, shoot, I can use that. Now, in, in those meetings, I might see two things I can use, eight things I can't. I'm going to take the two things, throw away the eight because the eight can't add anything to me. But those two do add something to me. It's like, OK, do I say something that adds to your game? Because you got to have a message. But if you only showing up listening to the message of a leader and all you're doing is regurgitating what a leader said, then you don't have a message yourself. Then you don't, Your personal relationship with God is a little shaky because you should have a message, some kind of message. He's got to be doing something for you. Verse seven says, on the contrary. They recognize that I have been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. So even though there was the circumcision and the uncircumcision, and Peter said, you know, Paul said, hey, we're not going to go with that. One, we're not about to take that over there to the uncircumcised. Titus wasn't rolling with it. We're not even running with that game. We're not taking the law over there. Then at the same time, he had enough game to show, but I'm on point with the gospel. Verse eight, for God, who is at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. Now, here's, here's the truth. There's people in churches today, and some churches see a certain activity. They, they've made it pretty much a law, and I'm not going to go into detail on this one. And I've said, well, your church don't do this. Another church, your church don't do that. 
And as a result, they go, we're better than you at your church because we do this and y'all don't do that. And yet you might listen to one of the speakers and the message is not that deep, is not that powerful, and it lacked plenty of gain. But then say, but we do this that y'all don't do, and therefore we got it going on, and that particular group is lost. And yet they can't even hardly break down the scriptures. Okay, I'm not talking about breaking down the scriptures from an academic perspective. I'm talking about giving some game that's going to add to your message of power. Speaking with power, right? Because the Bible says the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. That means a life that's showing that God is with you. Because that needs to be your message. Verse 9 says, James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. When they recognized the grace given to to me. In other words, this guy used to kill Christians. This guy did not believe in the Lord. And now he's breaking down the game inside out. And they know he's breaking down the game inside out. And they can hear it. And they know you cannot make up that much game. Because remember, he went by a revelation and his cat was rolling with all kinds of revelations, even talking about the surpassing revelations that he got. So he came in there breaking down game. And this is James, Cephas and John who roll with Jesus. And they know when they hear Jesus or not. They know it. And they listen to him talk and they're like, oh, shoot. Jesus is talking through this cat. So they recognize the grace. I know who he used to be, but all I know right now is Jesus is talking through this guy, Paul, who used to be Saul. Says here, they agree that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They're going, you got a game level and you can communicate to this uncircumcision people. Well, we over here wrestling with the circumcision group. You guys are free from that wrestling match. Go over there and do your thing because we still wrestling over here. So we're going to go ahead and give y'all the right hand of fellowship. Go ahead and do your thing. So now Paul now knows, okay, I wasn't racing, running my race in vain. My game was recognized. That game recognized game. Verse 10 says, all they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I have been eager to do all along. Paul opposes Cephas. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. So yes, you can be a leader. You can be standing condemned. Condemned eternally? It didn't say he was standing condemned eternally, but it means you better get your stuff on point. So he was standing condemned because what he was saying was not on point. What he was doing was not on point. So I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Verse 12, for before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belong to the circumcision group. So bingo, they were still wrestling with these folks in the circumcision group, wrestling with their faith, what have you, where Paul was not wrestling with that. So it's showing us consistently how these seasons of situations, whether it be mental, whether it be physical, whether it be in ministry, whether it be in leadership, whether it be in business, whether it be in marriages, whether it be with children, whatever it be, you have to wrestle. It's a time to wrestle. That's what this is showing us. Amen. Hallelujah. Verses 13 through 21, we will conclude it here. Again, a time to wrestle. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. So Barnabas was rolling for a minute. He got the right hand of fellowship with Paul. And then these guys had to be seriously convincing 
right? So you can be seriously convincing. You can hear a message and it can sound good to you. And even preachers will say, oh, don't that sound good? Oh, that's so good. Don't tell me, does it sound good? Tell me, tr is it true? Right? Because it might not sound good because it's against where I'm at right now. So don't be telling me, oh, don't it sound good? It could be, it could be challenging me. Tell me, hey, isn't this true? This is truth. Then whether it sounds good to somebody or not, be irrelevant. Because the truth will set you free. Yeah. Oh, take this medicine right here, this castor oil back in the day. And you taste it, go, oh, don't it taste good? Well, even an infant going to give you a frown, right? I've seen videos where infants is taking spinach or broccoli or something. And, man, they put a frown on the face like that. Oh, it tastes good. Then later on, you, you get to the taste because you realize it's good for you. So you acquire the taste or what have you. But don't be just saying something sounds good. And as a result of that, that's making it legit. Nah, I don't care whether it sounds good. You tell me what's real. Verse 14. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. Bingo. Forget how good it sounds. Is it in line with the truth of the gospel? It says not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. So not only better you better say it correctly. I want to see your life mirroring that truth. I want to see that power manifested in your life. Don't just show me you got a nice car and some nice suits or whatever the case may be. And I ain't down on you. You got a nice car and a nice suit. I'm just saying that's not going to get it. So let me tell you off the top, just based on this study alone, and I already had these convictions, but we've listened to this study. So let me restate my convictions in regard to what this study is saying about me personally. I do not care. If you are the leader of a church with an incredible suit, driving an incredible car with an incredible bank account, you cannot tell me that that is the sign that God has blessed you. You cannot tell me that. If you're preaching, the sign that God is with you is I want to hear the truth and that power being manifested in your life. Now, since the word says serve God, not serve money, then the fact that you have son is not going to get it for me. Because there was a rich man in purple who didn't make it. And Lazarus was poor his whole life. And he was ended up on the side of Abraham. So the money part, I'm all, I hey, amen to you. If God blessed you that way, he's blessed many kings and prophets financially. But that in and of itself is not going to do it for me. I'm not going to say you not blessed because you got it. But I'm going to be waiting to listen at what you do and what you say. I, I'm going to be looking at how you roll, right? What you involved in, how you involved in it, et cetera, right? Same with me. So when I saw they wasn't in acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? So, okay, Peter became a leader that started forcing his followers who should have been followers of Christ, not Peter. But, you know, this happens in religious settings. Following this person instead of following the truth that's in line with the gospel. And that's why a lot of people don't go through verbatim breaking down the gospel. So they're living in a way that's different than what the word is saying and then saying, Okay, live like I'm living because neither one of us is going to be living like the word is saying. So I will contradict the word by the way I live and then you follow me. Roll the way I roll. Follow your leadership. Wow. So verse 15 says, we who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith. In Jesus Christ. So there's another lane, and you know this, Peter. We know this. Then what's going on with you on why you not here? Now, we know historically Peter had an issue with the courage thing. And so he's wrestling. So he needs some help. So Paul is helping him in his wrestling match, 
right? So somebody can come into the gospel after you, later than you, have stronger convictions than you, even if you're the leader of a particular movement and need to help you learn how to wrestle in your faith, okay? So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So why are you listening to these folks that are telling you to jump through all these hoops and making it a law when you're not going to be justified because breaking one law means you're done forever. So why are you approaching it that way? Well, Rodney, so that means we got a license to sin? No, it means that you got grace, which means you strive for, for, for perfection, but not perfection of the law, perfection of the faith, which means that you can be rolled by the law and then something comes up where faith is now being required at the split of a second and you don't have none. And then what the law going to do for you at that point? Then that would happen with the rich young ruler, right? The rich, I've been following all these things since I was a child. Okay, give up all you got, come follow me. Oh, shoot, I can't do that. So faith is required in the split second that you got to act on faith. So you got to have faith in the tank, right? You got to have treasure stored up in heaven so that that Holy Spirit kicks in on command. And that means you got to be wrestling in the meantime so that when it's time to rock and roll, right? When it's time to move, you can go ahead and move and then be hesitating all the time. Verse 17, but if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners. Doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? So if we go by the law and then we fail at one point of the law so that we're no different than the other cats that don't even have the law because it only takes one sin to be deemed unrighteous. So we right there the same as anybody else. And that's why there's a lot of Christians that look and act just like everybody else, look no different than the world, listen to everything the world listens to, do everything the world does, participate in everything the world participates in, because you're holding on to something that's not even true or real. So as a result, one person who's not holding on to nothing is equal to you who's holding on to everything except for one thing, if you're going by the law. But if you're going by faith, that's the differentiation. So then you can help those who are holding on to nothing, learn faith. And they say, OK, I trust and believe in him. I can activate that when I need it. Right. When I'm called to it. Verse 18. If I rebuild what I destroy, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. So I died to the law so that I might live for God. So by the law, I was put to death because one sin means death. So I died to the law. Through the law, I'm already dead. So Paul is going, I was an expert at the law, right? I was a Pharisee of Pharisees, he said, from the tribe of Benjamin. So that cat was Saul. That cat had to die, right? Because I got woke up. To the, fact, to the fact that I didn't even know what I was talking about. I didn't recognize Jesus as Lord. And so all that I knew about the law was zero. So now I'm a new creation. So why would I go back to that person who's no longer even alive? I'm a brand new person. So I got a whole new mindset. That's why I can now break down this game that I used to not even be able to see the gamer. Right. I couldn't even see it. I couldn't even see that the gamer was the gamer whose name is Jesus Christ. I couldn't even see that the game host was the game host. And now that person is gone who couldn't see the game host. And now I'm got all kinds of game because it's the new person that's got the game, not the old person now got the game. Oh, Saul got the game. Now he's like, nope, Saul ain't got the game. Saul done. Paul got the game. That's a new 
person. We got to become a new creation. You're going to be new wine and old wine skins, being the same person that you were involved in the same things that you always been involved in. So verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the life I now live in the body. No, Rodney, not the life Saul lived in the body. No, he just told you that person was dead. He don't say, oh, this new life I now live in the body as the same person Saul. That's how a lot of people think it. That's how a lot of people live in it right now as Christians. No, 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 no. The life I live, the life I live, this new person, Paul, this is a brand new person. This person has never been in this body before. This is a new person in the body empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's why I know the game. That's a new creation, a new creature. That's the life I now live in the body. I used to not live in the body. I was in the spiritual realm. I'm in this body that Saul used to live in. Now Paul lives in it. Saul gone. So the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could have been gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. So that person who would always try to come back, that Saul, I can't let him come back from the dead. This new person, Paul, empowered by the Holy Spirit is the life I live. That's the spiritual me. My spirit confirms with the Lord's spirit that we are children of God. I'm a co-heir of Christ. And I'm going on in that direction to the point where I will forget that Saul ever existed. So when people start going, uh, isn't that the guy that used to do all that craziness? He's like, no, that dude didn't exist. He, he, I don't know who you're talking about. I can tell you who he was because I, I met him before, right? When we shook hands, when he was saying bye-bye and I was coming in, that person isn't here anymore. We are either reigning as priests or we are not, says the line of the tribe of Judah. The root of David, as it says in Revelation 1, 6, has made us to a kingdom of priests. We serve our God and reign on the earth. It says in 1 Peter 2, 9, he has made us into a royal priesthood, a priesthood in the order of Melchizedek, who has no beginning and no end. Jesus Christ is that high priest forever. We're in that priesthood. That's what makes us a royal priesthood because we are priesthood in the priesthood of the king and priest of Salem, which is peace. And that is why we say peace in. Amen. Dear Lord, thank you so much again for your word. Thank you so much for strengthening me with your word and your spirit. I'm so grateful for it. Thank you for the people who turn in and listen to what it is that um, we're saying and that uh, we're grateful for the camaraderie. It's great to see when people are, are viewing and we hope that more people will, but you know, it's your will, Father. You know, there's only a few that was on the Noah's Ark, so <laughs> it is what it is. I'm gonna roll with whatever you say to roll with, but I appreciate the people that do come and focus in that I can add value to your message and your game. And thank you so much for Jesus Christ, who's the game of all games. And it's his name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. All righty. So thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. And you know how we say it. Peace in. Bye, everybody. We love you. Peace in. <laughs> love you guys. Bye. <laughs>